All right. Hello and welcome everyone. Um, my name is Meredith Epp. I'm the Industry Partnership Manager at APCO. Um, and I appreciate you joining us for our APCO Community Webinar, A Designer's Guide to the Circular Economy and Sustainable Packaging. Before we get started today, we wanted to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country throughout Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters, and culture. We pay our respect to their elders past, present, and emerging. So without further ado, I'll hopefully be able to go on to the next slide here. So today's session we're talking about with this main question, how important is design when considering packaging sustainability? And I think our presenters today would probably say incredibly important. So our two guest presenters are Pippa Corey and Ralph Moyle. I'll give you a, a bit more of a detailed bio and background after this. And, but so our two speakers will talk a little bit about why design is incredibly important in achieving packaging sustainability and that delicate balance of function and aesthetics that need to be achieved through packaging sustainability and as we work towards achieving circular economy here in Australia. So there's a lot of different considerations that we'll be looking for but what we're hoping today is that for you attending here, you can take that idea of how can you as a designer really be better informed about the important and critical role that you play at the end of life for the packaging that you design. So we hope that you enjoy today's webinar. Thank you again for joining us. Again, feel free to use that chat box or the webinar Q&A questions as we go along. So a little bit to frame up of why APCO is hosting this. In case you aren't across the 2025 national packaging targets before, so what's that thing that we're all working towards? So in 2018, government and industry came together and announced the 2025 national packaging targets. So this first one here is 100% of packaging to be reusable, recyclable, or compostable by 2025. Uh, these circles that you see up here are how we're currently tracking. So 88% of packaging in Australia could be recycled or reused or composted. So you've got about a 12% gap here. And this is where design really comes in importantly. The other three supporting targets are 70% of plastic packaging to be recycled or composted by 2025. We actually have a long way to go on this target. We're only at 16% of plastic packaging that is currently being recycled or composted. The third target, is 50% of packaging to have recycled content across all packaging. And, and we're currently at 35% for this. So that's that inclusion of recycled content back into materials and driving that demand for a circular economy. And finally, the fourth target is the phase out of problematic and unnecessary single use plastic packaging um, through innovation, redesign, or alternative delivery methods. So again, design plays a critical role, especially in this first target. So designing for recyclability, reusability, or compostability, but it also has important touch points across these other three targets as well. So just keep those targets in the end of your, in the back of your mind as we go through today's session. Um, earlier this year, we also launched our packaging future, which is a document that it's really the roadmap to achieving the 2025 targets. And it, this looks at three core outcomes that need to be achieved. So outcome number one is packaging designed for circularity. Again, where design comes in. The other two areas are um, improved collection and recycling systems. So even if packaging is designed to be recyclable, is it actually getting collected and making its way back into the system? And that third outcome is expanded markets for used packaging. So whether that be incorporated in recycled content, it back into packaging or potentially back into other products or even civil construction. So this is the collective impact framework. Today, we'll really be focusing in on that outcome number one. So packaging designed for circularity. There are five different strategies that come under this. So the first one, reduce packaging through design innovation, the phase out of problematic and unnecessary single use plastic packaging, increased proportion of reusable packaging, design for material recycling, and finally, design for compostability where appropriate. 
So as designers, it's really important to keep these things in the back of your mind as you um, design packaging and understand what's that balance between function, protecting your product, and also making sure that, that it delivers the product safely and has uh, aesthetics that work with the consumer. So when we think about how we're tracking towards the targets through our material flow analysis, we were able to analyze there's about 5.4 million tons of packaging that's put onto the Australian marketplace. Uh, this data was from 2017-2018. So of that 5.4 million tons, 12% of that is that not recyclable by design. So that's about 600,000 tons that we're losing just in the design phase. There's a, so there's a huge impact there for um, improved design to work towards the targets and to have that packaging have an end of life. Um, then there are other opportunities potentially for design here as well. So of that 4.8 million tons that actually could be, that is recyclable, 32% of that doesn't actually get collected. So if that doesn't get collected, are there more opportunities for designers to communicate how this packaging could be recycled or what should a consumer do with it at the end of life? The more opportunities around there. And then again, going back into the recovery process where there's another 18% loss at recovery facility. So what else can design potentially play a role in this space? So that's just a bit of the frame up in terms of why design is incredibly important when it comes to working towards the 2025 targets. And you as designers have a really critical role to play. So I'd like to hand over to our first speaker today. She is a fantastic individual. She's a founder of Philo & Co that helps to create a businesses and brands transition to a circular economy. Pippa has a bachelor's in product design and has more than 10 years experience within the creative industry, innovating how creative businesses and brands can redefine how we design. Her experience spans packaging design, product innovation, brand strategy, brand identity, and brand communication. She has a breadth of experience working with leading FMCG brands, design agencies, and has led circular packaging design in business thinking for the future. Um, Pippa has a holistic view in solving systematic changes required to transition from the linear to the circular design practices and businesses. She's also a participant in APCO's 2020 design working group, actively contributing to the development of strategies to deliver the 2025 national packaging targets. Uh, Pippa also excitingly has been selected to be part of the X expedition around the world sailing voyage um, in 2021 to research plastic and toxins in our ocean um, and with the ambition to define closed loop solutions for plastic and packaging waste. So Pippa, we will love to hear more about your sailing adventures when you return from your trip, <laughs> but we're also really excited to hear about your take on the circular economy from a very design specific um, viewpoint. So Pippa, over to you. Um, so thank you for the introduction. It's so great to see so many familiar faces and so many of you joining us today. Um, I just want to start with a quote that comes from the um, comes from IDEO. Um, so this is a quote that's always really resonated with me, particularly with our journey ahead for designing a circular economy. Um, and it's really to remember that there's always room for innovation and that great design is, is never finished. So just really quickly, Meredith's pretty much covered everything, um, but it'll be no surprise that I am covering the circularity today. My focus is really to empower and inspire design communities to lead the transition to a circular economy and bring that circular knowledge and key principles into our creative industry. And I do this across a couple of key areas from education and team training through to looking at organizations, brands um, or business strategies and helping them to find circular packaging solutions. So I think it's really important we start with understanding what a circular economy is. It essentially has three key principles, uh, which looks to design out waste and pollution, um, re keep resources in use for as long as possible and regenerate natural systems. 
And a circular economy is an alternative model that looks beyond our current take make waste approach. Um, it's restorative and regenerative by design, and it really encourages systems wide innovation, enabling materials to be maintained in either industrial or biological cycles. And through design, there's the opportunity to manage these materials or packaging flows um, instead of using them up, which is our current approach. Um, it's underpinned by transitioning to the use of renewable energy and eliminates has just the toxic materials. So those innermost loops that you see on the butterfly diagram is where we can keep products and materials at their highest value and provide the larger cost savings in terms of material, labor and energy or capital. Um, and obviously there are associated externalities such as greenhouse gas emissions, water or land use. Um, and I think specific to packaging with a true circular economy, there's no beginning, middle and end of life, but a continual loop. And pack packaging should be designed to return to one of these two material inputs. And I think anyone who's familiar with APCO's waste hierarchy within the SPGs um, will see the similarity in resource prioritization, as well as the collective impact um, framework strategies that Meredith um, just took us through. And I think what's really important is to understand why we need the circular economy um, to ensure we have a really strong business case to build from. Um, I believe we're currently very limited by our system um, and I believe how we shape the narrative of a circular economy will be really key in achieving its successes and ensuring businesses and individuals are no longer exposed to the growing threats of our linear economy. And for me personally, um, the opportunities and the risk mitigation far outweigh our current way of doing business. We're seeing more and more organisations and solely governments adopting circular business models and strategies. And what's certain is that companies that are you know, really embedding circularity into the heart of their businesses are finding ways to safeguard the planet and turn a profit at the same time. So from a broader um, impact perspective, um, I think it's really key to, to understand the role that the circular economy will play in curbing um, climate change and closing that gap that we need to achieve our greenhouse gas emissions over the next 10 to 12 years. And from a social perspective, it offers an abundance of um, opportunities for job creation. The National Waste Policy shared um, that for, 10, 000, for every 10,000 tonnes of waste recycled, it creates 9.2 jobs versus 2.8 for landfill so there's key environment um, environmental and social aspects that we really need to be building into our narrative for a circular economy and to achieve a circular economy it first starts with with us and our mindsets um, and really how we can challenge our traditional linear thinking processes um, we also need to ensure that it has strategies embedded at the heart of an organisation. And there are five key business models to a circular economy, all of which look to narrow the use of resources, slow down their use, close or regenerate. And I think where, um, where is really critical to understand is the undeniable correlation between how we design and our opportunity for circularity. I think this visual shows really clearly the role of creatives and designers have in building a circular economy. Um, and it's really important to keep in mind that up to 80% of the environmental impacts of a product or a service are defined in the early design stages. So it's exceedingly difficult to go back and undo those effects if we later find out that they're producing undesirable consequences, be it social or environmental. And this really comes at a time, particularly for packaging, um, where the landscape is evolving at pace. And there's a lot of considerations that um, can no longer be add-ons that really need to be embedded into a product or packaging's design experience, but also directly linked to a comprehensive sustainability goal and commitment. So it's really critical that the full picture is, is captured at design. So looking at circular design, um, it uses a different uh, design tools and measures. It's effective design, circular design looks beyond a single product lifecycle for a single user, but instead designs for broader system and their interconnectedness. Um, and it looks to really understand and define the true value proposition for the human needs, its feasibility and viability within an organization, and consider all aspects of a product or packaging lifespan. So designing for those inner loops that we saw, saw on the butterfly diagram is the core difference between circular and linear design thinking. 
So if we take the Ellen MacArthur Foundation design process as an example, it's these two early stages that are really key for us to hone in on, to really get to know the user and the, and the system, and to really put into words the key design challenge and our intent as a designer or an organization, and how we're going to measure and capture that data. So how have these business models and strategies been translated into packaging design solutions? We've got some great examples that are out there at the moment. Um, Lewis Road Creamery is, um, is a prime one. From an aesthetic and functional perspective, it emulates that of a glass bottle, yet it's enabled really significant reductions in material use and a true closed loop of resources, which is really clearly communicated on the front of packaging. And it fully respects the technical feasibility of recycling and the value of the material that it's using. Um, they've also recently launched a refill or a reusable bottle um, in partnership with um, selected stores in New Zealand. So they're also looking at those inner loops of product life extension as well. Garçon Wines is a great international case study. Um, they, it's safe to say that circularity is embedded in, in everything that they do. They've significantly improved their um, distribution through the primary and outer packaging design, which has been designed to fit through a conventional letterbox and it achieves a really impressive array of circular credentials and cost savings across uh, the supply chain to overcome the weight, transportation and delivery challenges of traditional wine bottles. And this is really specific to e-commerce um, and particularly came to light off the back of the um, knowledge of high carbon uh, emissions associated with missed deliveries. So they've really enhanced that customer convenience and through off-pack communications and on-pack communications, really encourage um, sustainable buying behaviours. And Loop is, I'm sure, a platform that many of you have heard of, um, and they're on a mission to create zero waste consumerism. So they really focus on those innermost um, loops of the circular economy. And they're designed for durability, um, to really extend the product life, and to provide the packaging as a service. So they're really um, using the existing e-commerce infrastructure to be convenient um, for sale. And aesthetically, they've really positioned themselves in line with the traditional products um, and allow for personalization and branding across their partnerships. And in order to do this, um, they really need to, to measure and obviously um, to share the details of what's backing this. And the full LCA that they conducted shows that um, they break even after about three uses, but after 10 cycles, Loop has nearly 35% lower environmental impacts compared to regular e-commerce. So the proof is almost in the, in the pudding there, um, but that's a great tool that they've used in order to communicate the benefits um, from an environmental perspective. So across the board, there's some strong commonalities with what we're seeing in, in circular packaging. And it's not to say it's an easy feat. It's obviously will have thrown up some challenges for, for designers and for brands. Um, but I just want to talk through a couple of the key observations. Um, I think the main thing is having that uh, quote in mind that um, innovation is, is an ongoing process. And a lot of these designs won't have been um, come to fruition overnight. It would have been the case of a lot of development and making honest mistakes as they go. And I think that's an element that we need to keep in mind as, as we pro progress through the transition to a circular economy. They also designed with the intention of creating very distinct material flows with little to no contaminants and really respect the biological technical resource flows that they're working with and have a clear understanding of the existing waste hierarchy or infrastructures that they would need to create or that are available them to process those materials. And a circular economy is obviously going to challenge our mindsets and behaviours. So it's really critical that communication is supported by well-defined brand sustainability commitments. And packaging is becoming more and more of a key vehicle for that communication and brand commitments to customers. So we need to be considering this um, and having clear and appropriate um, messages for targeted audiences. And convenience, particularly for those inner loops, is really key. So when we're in those um, product life extensions or products or services, the performance and the aesthetics really need to be consistent or improved to single use to have that recognition. Um, but also from a convenient factor, if they're not able to be convenient, then certainly an additional added value, whether it's an incentive or additional functionality should be considered. So what can we do as designers or design agencies to start the transition to a circular mindset? 
I think remembering that circular design combines human-centered design, life cycle design, and systems thinking, it's really good to start with the why. What is the true problem that we're looking to solve with the design? And can we lock any out-of-box ideas that still meet the requirements of the packaging, protection, safety, and accessibility? Um, but there's also a need to balance that human element with the system awareness. And circular design really looks to zoom much further out during the design processes and observe those broader systems to understand how your product or your service is going to interact with them. And there will be some barriers, I think, where we have a big opportunity from a sustainability perspective is to really understand the risks, the sustainability risks that may face your business, the product that you're designing or the sectors that you're working in. By understanding those barriers is really going to highlight where we need to invest time and create opportunities for innovation. And there was a, I can't remember who said it once, but it was a great quote that material becomes like a currency when you know its value. And I think really understanding how materials flow and the value of the materials that your organization is investing in can really help define decisions at the design stage and bring us into those inner loops. Um, and this is a tool that's um, accessible through IDEO and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Um, so we've learned with circularity, we need to rethink a linear use cycle and mapping out the journey of packaging or for a product will really ensure that your design is staying at a useful state for as long as possible and bring value at every stage. So we start by asking how long is it intended, is its intended use? Could this be extended in some way? And then we go through a series of, of what next to, to map out that, that journey. Um, and before finishing, we really consider what the practical challenges could be in terms of disposal, collection or recovery, um, whether it's a component or whole packaging level. And through that, we can start to find some circular pathways and look to, look to think how we can redesign. Um, and that will be where we can use tools um, and accesses through APCO's SVGs and other circular design methodologies. So I think there's some four key circular principles that I would like to leave with you today. Um, I think the, the main thing is setting a circular vision. Um, ultimately, this will need to come at a leadership level to create the business imperatives and cultural changes needed. But a circular vision should really encapsulate the key areas of sustainability that are relevant to your market um, and be embedded at the heart of your business or your brand. And understanding your sustainability hurdles can identify the instruments for immediate action and create a tangible roadmap as well for implementing. Um, if you're not in a role that can directly influence decision, um, I think it's key to be curious, to stay curious, and always look to provide a competitive sorry, compelling evidence to support the case for circularity within your teams or organisations. And how we move beyond recycling will come down to behavioural um, changes, industry changes and partnerships like we saw with the great case of Loop. Um, so how we position these new business models and partnerships will have a big impact. And I think we really need to position these as problem solvers um, and the circular uh, propositions will gain a lot more traction from customers or from other businesses or suppliers um, if we position these as solutions to, to existing problems. And that's obviously where collaboration comes in. Um, we will need to work together on this. Um, it's not down to designers to solve, um, but we are certainly a big part in the process. Um, and I've seen a number of brands um, collaborating even with competitors to, to get shared objectives um, achieved in packaging targets. Um, and to really rethink design, so understanding the implications of the design decisions we make and having a broader um, understanding in terms of capturing the human needs, the full life cycle and the broader systems. Um, and these solutions really need to motivate people which can lead to changes um, in the right place for the right reasons. And it's critical that we have evidence to back this. Like with anything we're trying to manage, we need to have clear measures and metrics in play. And I think this needs to be coming in at a design brief level, um, as it would be with a lot of other key design considerations that we take. Um, and last but not least is communication. We have a really strong voice and a really strong opportunity to inspire and educate through design. Um, but we need to keep it positive and inspirational. I think when we're presenting environmental claims through our designs, we need to be really truthful and specific. And again, have that substantiation with our measures and our metrics. 
And that's it from me. So um, we'd be more than happy to take any questions, obviously, during the, uh, the webinar. If you've got anything you want to reach out to me specifically to ask, then please do contact me. Um, and if you want to find out more how we could collaborate together, then please drop me an email and we can have a chat. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Pippa. That was fantastic. I, I always get so inspired and, and a beautiful presentation from design experts. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Um, our next speaker is Ralph Moyle. So Ralph is an experienced packaging consultant with an extensive knowledge in the packaging industry. Um, through a unique range of senior management experiences in packaging operations, technical and quality assurance, um, quality assurance, and in large and medium FMCG businesses. Ralph brings increased value to a business throughout the value of smarter packaging at less waste. Ralph is also the fa a founding member uh, and facilitator at the Australian Institute of Packaging. I know we have a number of AIP members here today, so welcome everyone. And Ralph is also the recent recipient of AIP's Founders Award, an award that has only been given to four other outstanding individuals in 57 years. So I think Ralph's presentation will probably speak for itself in terms of his experience and expertise in this space. But we are very, very fortunate to have you with us here today, Ralph. So I will hand over to you whenever you're ready. Thank you very much, Meredith. That's a very flattering introduction. Uh, so let's, my, my function today is certainly Pippa's given you the beautiful side of it and design, which uh, attracts so many consumers to, to our products. My focus is going to be on the technical side and I'm going to talk initially about the whys and the hows and the takeouts that you can uh, put back into your business. Okay, we know the, the 2025 national packaging targets, and that is the driving force behind so many of these webinars and training courses that we're doing, is to provide you with the resources how your, you and your business can achieve those particular targets. I uh, thank you, Helen Lewis, uh, who did a fantastic presentation last week, and uh, I hope many of you got to uh, to listen to it if not I'm sure APCO has it in its library to share but but Helen really quantified the scale of things and the amount of data that's uh, available to us and this particular slide and I did borrow one other one from her I think was really powerful and, and I know Meredith used it at the introduction but I'm going to put a bit of a twist on that and you see those negative yields there. And think about the yield in your own business, how much your business would focus on yield losses of product, no matter what you make. If you're losing it, it's lost money. And that is part of this overall process. And how much does design play? Well, I'll go a few steps further than Meredith. Certainly the 12% is there, that, that's clear. But you can look more closely at the 32% of why it is not collected for recycling. And there's many examples of where design pays and, and a critical factor in that. And uh, I'll give you some examples of that shortly. And also the, in the 18% 18 lost in recovery process. Well, why? Okay. Um, the prep tool certainly describes that. And uh, several weeks ago now, but Anthony Payton did an, also an excellent presentation as he should on prep because he drives and builds the thing. And if you need more information there, please go back to the APCO archives to, to uh, watch what Anthony had to say there because there's a lot to be learned out of using the prep in design aspects. And I mean this in a very proactive way, not just reactive of putting in your specs and getting an ARL label, but using it in a proactive way to get a better design and a better outcome. You guys have, uh, the 30th of June has passed. You've all put in your annual reports. You've updated your action plans. You're, you're laughing. You think it's all got a, under control. Well, the, the truth is this is an ongoing process. To me, it's a very much a managerial process and you happen to report it to APCO. But where does design fit? Yes, as Meredith clearly put out, five of the key strategies there within your, your action plan relate directly to design and getting it right the first time. So making your annual report work, getting better results each year, because I, I do notice a lot more 
executives taking a much more closer interest in the reports that have been driven these days because it's publicly listed and a lot of people take interest in it. So if you do want to get and improve results and get a tap on pat on the back by the boss, which, which isn't bad by the way, listening to this, putting this into action, I think is a very proactive approach. I think one of the key aspects which I, I feel is, is rarely understood is, oh, we'll send it off in the recycling, it'll get sorted. Well, not necessarily so. And if you don't understand how a recycling facility works, then I think you're going to miss a lot of really key points. Um, up until all this COVID fun, many of our half day AIP training courses, we actually conducted at recycling centres because not only do I want people to enjoy the most fragrant aroma that only a recycling centre can provide, but also to physically see how they work and what do they do, but also understand what they cannot do. And if you start understanding that a lot better, using the prep tool makes a whole lot more sense. Thank you, Planet Arc, for what I think is one of the most powerful one pages uh, ever put together to describe this process of, well, hang on, I put this, I, our item's got to be recyclable. It's made of PET, therefore it must be recyclable. Not necessarily so, and there can be a whole lot of reasons of why, okay? Now, if we start in the, cur the this curve here and we look at colorants and the comment point there is whether it's a, a meat tray that's black, therefore it might be made of PET, but if the light system can't go through, it doesn't see it, therefore it goes to waste. If it's a clear clear tray, it goes through. Um, here's a water bottle, clear PET, fine, it will go through. Here's a PET bottle, but it's tainted blue. So it's a colorant that's added to it because blue relates to fresh water, da 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 da. However, and one of the uh, MRF managers that I spoke to about this, I said, surely that's a contaminant. He said, certainly. He only needs one of those coloured bottles to come through and he's lost 20, the equivalent of 20,000 clear ones. Think about how that ratio of contamination might work in your facility. So the choice of a colourant in the, in the material has an immediate impact on its recyclability go back to some of those figures that Helen presented. The next one is adhesives. What does an adhesive do? It sticks things together, that's its job. But if you can't unstick them, you have some issues. Um, fortunately, there's been a lot of really good developments there. And I have a, a couple of examples in our PETA awards to demonstrate the effectiveness and the new style of products that are available to you in the market, which can get you past that particular hurdle. There's issues of inks, whether it's water soluble or solvent based. If you don't know what it is in the packaging that you're dealing with, get hold of your supplier, drill down and work it out because certain, certain inks are not really compatible. And the next question to think about there is, do you actually need all of that ink on the package that you're presenting to the marketplace? I'm sure all the marketers that were present will say, no, I've got to have all my graphics on, on the front face there. I've got to tell the story. And I guess you do. Well, tell me why you need all the ink on the back of the pack that not seen on shelf and probably is only used by the consumer when they're at home. I would argue that a lot of the ink that we're using on packaging is unnecessary, doesn't convey any messages, and it's just there because it, it kind of looks pretty. I don't think that argument held, holds up anymore. So when you're looking at your graphics and your artwork and you're looking at the back or even the side of the pack, ask yourself, why is all that extra background ink needed? Okay. The question of weight, um, certainly very large items uh, are, are simply too big for the MERPs. Likewise, the very small. And I think uh, Anthony mentioned that the limit there is about 40 mil by 40 mil by 40. So caps and the like, loose items like that just simply fall through. Uh, I was questioned yesterday about large shippers. Well, if you put them out in three-dimensional shape, they are too big and they will get lost. But if you knock them down flat, guess what? They will go through. So how you present and the weight of the item has a significant impact of how it goes through.
its size and its shape or other things. But please uh, go to the Planet Ark website, grab a copy of that, pin it to the wall where all the packaging technologists and the like work and make sure they please don't forget that one. That is the most powerful description. Here's just a, a very, very, very simple schematic of how process flow of how a MRF works and with trundles and whatever. And we don't have capability nor time today, but may I strongly encourage you to YouTube um, MRF facilities uh, around the country. Uh, there's an excellent one that Vizi puts out in New Zealand of the Onahunga plant, which describes it beautifully. But if you're not familiar with how these things work, the scale and the speed of them, I suggest you become very familiar of it. The other key takeout here is they're really only designed to take out some of the basic primary materials. Essentially, this is what they're after. Why? Because they can sell them. That's what a MRF is. It's a commercial business just like the one you work for. And they want to sell something that they purchased for more than what they bought it for and allows them profit and capital to return. But essentially, all of those recycling facilities are after paper and cardboard, which is generally about 60 odd percent of what they handle. Steel cans, glass bottles, aluminium cans. And yes, we mentioned plastics, but essentially they're only after clear PET and HDPE. And why? Because they have value and they can sell them. So they're the key things that they are after. And if our recycling system is to work, you've got to be working with these guys, not against them. And by working against them is in the next slide where we illustrate, and this, this I could be putting up pages of pages here of what they can't handle and don't want. And I've only put the nice things up there. Um, I think the ones I generally get reminded of is um, poo bombs. And if you think about what is a poo bomb, Ralph, that's a filled nappy that somebody's put into the recycling stream thinking that someone somewhere is going to recycle that. Well, I don't think so, but they are prolific. Uh, those who work in MRFs have got a long and illustrious history of fire extinguishers, firearms, engine blocks, and all sorts of wonderful things. To say that there's some work to be done in educating the general public in what is and is not recyclable is a considerable understatement. This is a, an old one, a teaser about the hierarchy of things. And I did note the question that popped up from Tunda and that was a really good tease. Trust her to come up with a nice one that she did, which I'll leave to the Q&A session. But the question there is, which is the right hierarchy and between reduce and reuse and recycle, which is the, the traditional hierarchy. But she's got a teaser in a question, but I'll, I'll let her ask that in the Q&A session afterwards. But I'll gladly handle the answer if you like. Predominantly, we're talking about food today, but we could just as easily be talking about pharmaceuticals. We could be talking about general goods, the whole lot. But packaging has its core roles. And we, while we understand them, I don't think it's always conveyed because I think it's, it's just taken for granted. But it is there to protect. It's there to transport safely. And you're there certainly to provide shelf life to the particular item that you're shipping. And there's many other key factors, but let's not forget those key things because if any of those three miss up, we really do have a problem. Uh, you asked for hierarchies, I think was one of the key questions that Twin asked and there are others. I've chosen this one, there's many to go with. But if you're in a, in a group discussion, you've got a, a, a project coming up, you've got a marketer, you've got a, an operational person, you've got somebody from supply chain, you're there representing the packaging side and there may be other contributors to this. Is how can you help the overall thinking of the team as you move through the design process? A one pager like this is often a really good, uh, good one to just share with them in just one piece of paper only is look, this is how we've got to make this work to add value to our business and to have the right product going out to the right customers. Um, and the reduce, reuse and the like is all there. Okay, so borrow that one folks, it's a, it's a very powerful one. I tease the question here and I, I'm challenged with it endlessly as I'm sure all of you are. What does the consumer want? The simple answer is everything. 
because we're all consumers and at different times we want uh, everything. Sometimes it's cheap, this time we want that. But many other facets of it, the consumer is a fickle beast. And I think as we've moved through the challenges of COVID and I'm talking to you from lockdown Melbourne um, for the second time, which isn't a whole lot of fun, but it certainly impacts in the way consumers shop and the, what they look for. And certainly in the plastic free January and all the challenges were out there. And yet when COVID came and people are ripping the shelves apart, it's the cans, the jars and the traditional formats that went first. Uh, so the consumer at different times has different needs and it's really hard to quantify, but that's why we have marketers to translate that. And I'm sure they've got all the answers for you. This is just a few of my thoughts on it. I'm sure you've got your own and you would, this list could be very, very long. But these are some of the key expectations. If I had to really cull through it and make my own summary of it, they're the six of the, out of 10, I guess, of the top most powerful influences that are coming through that we have to consider in design and material choices and functionality, as well as doing all the priorities topics that I've touched on a few slides ago. But clearly you do need to be putting forward a socially responsible angle. And as packaging technologists, if I was to be critical of a bunch I really love, we're really lousy at telling how good we've been at times and some of the outstanding work that's occurred over the last few decades in re reducing waste and alternative not to say there's plenty not to be done if you think about the very first slide of the tonnages that Meredith suggested there. They're, they're massive and the losses are great. But to make sure your business is well represented, these are the kind of aspects you can go through and then be pleased, be proud to tell people about it and put, perhaps put them for, for Peter Award winners. If you want a challenge, here's the good one. This one is the one that I, I take most personally and the one that really drives me nuts at times. And for those in the food industry, here it goes. So you've got on one side there, you've got your 2025 targets and reduction and all the rest of it. And it's fantastic. And we got to do it. There's no two ways about it. We're doing it and we've got to be better at it. But then hello, you've also got the national food waste strategy. And that is halving Australia's food waste by 2030. Okay, 2025, 2030, not a lot of time left in either, thank you very much. If you don't have a copy of the National Food Waste Strategy and understand the implications of it, then I suggest that's one of the takeouts you're gonna to do today is go and download it and start reading it. It's not a small document, but it's really important and the implications to your business may be very severe. So here's the challenge, pack techs, is it food waste or minimal packaging? And the answer is, sorry guys, it's both. And working your way through that can only be done with well thought through design and understanding better the, the full supply chain that your product goes through and what does your consumer want, okay? Now, when I talk about food waste and the scale of it, the lady in the middle there, her name is Ronnie Khan. She was the founder of Oz Harvest. And uh, my compliments to her for the fabulous work that she's done. And you can see she's surrounded by a lot of food. In fact, she's surrounded by 298 kilograms of food. And why is that number significant? That's the amount of food an average Australian household wastes in one year, every year. And if you're surprised and shocked by that, I hope you are, because that's the scale of what's going on. Now, packaging isn't the total solution to all of those factors, but it's a contributing factor, getting the right packaging for the right product through the right supply chain to the consumer in the right way is one of the more social obligations that we have in addition to meeting the national packaging targets. By the way, please Google that and pin it to the board somewhere and just to remind people of the scale of what the challenge really is. Uh, so trying to balance this out is between 
too much packaging or too little packaging is really one of the tough quandaries and without doing a lot of testing and trialing it, it and measurement it, it is difficult I got that so what is one takeout that I want you to take from today's webinar is how you would balance that and how would you convey it to those that you work with in your business so get your pens out guys get a piece of paper and I just want to write want you to write down the next eight words and that is as per the bottom line there as little as possible as much as necessary I repeat as little as possible as much as necessary and that's the kind of balance that you've got to find in your design of your packaging to match all of those two things up okay now the next slide will illustrate that in a slightly different way and the bit in the middle there at the cross is what I call the Goldilocks spot not too hot not too cold you know the right news nursery rhyme but to to score the impact of if you don't get your packaging right and you've in fact underpackaged it, the dashed line going up uh, logarithmically is the environmental impact of that damage because you're not just losing the packaging, you're losing the product, all the energies, all of the resources that went into making it get lost really quickly and the costs go up and nobody's going to love you in the business if that's a problem. Conversely, if you go on the overpackaging side, which is always very tempting to do, and the slope of that graph is significantly more gentle because the product isn't lost at all. It's just the factors related to the packaging. But there's still losses and it's still an environmental impact. So trying to find that optimum pack design in the middle is critical. And that's why this process that we're discussing with you today is so very important in addressing the overall wastage factors here. Waste of food, sure. And the next one's waste of packaging. All right, let's 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 summarize a little bit here. Clearly, recycling's on the public agenda and uh, they want it easy, they want it transparent, but they don't want it to be wasted. They do want it to be recyclable. The key point here is, uh, I've got to say that Recyclers are good, but they're not magicians. Retailers are certainly have their own standards. And we'll get to that very shortly. But you really do have to understand the process. Very quickly here, Coles, Willys, Aldi have got their own standards. If you don't have copies of them, get them, understand them, because they do follow APCO principles, but they're not all the same. And if you're going to deal with those three, you really do need to understand it. Download them. We'll move along quickly, otherwise we'll lose out of Q&A sessions. Your ARL labels, I'm going to skip that one. Anthony covered that beautifully just a few weeks ago. Sustainable packaging guidelines that APCO put out. This is a perla. This has been redeveloped last year. It's fantastic what they've done. Uh, the AIP and APCO will be running a half-day training course on the 1st of September with yours truly, and we'll take you through all of that. So please, I look forward to seeing you on that date, and we'll discuss that in more details then. Uh, quickly, the award winners from Peter. Look, here's some examples which we can have a brief discussion. Coke was a big winner. They went R pet across the board. They changed their Sprite, Sprite bottle from being green to clear. That was a big challenge for their marketers. They're committed to what they're doing. They won the major gong this year. It was a great example. Brown's Dairies with their, their Tetra Pak carton, their strength was they looked at all the materials that went into their packaging and looked at where is the most um, FSC certified, recycled content, renewable in every sense. That's why they won that gong. So they took it in a very proactive view in that area. We talked about adhesives earlier on. Uh, this award winner was from UPM Raffle Attack uh, and Kiwi Labels. Key factors here is while the label sticks on, it separates easily from the base material, giving the clear PET to go through. That's one of the key things uh, you do need to investigate. Those are two good companies to start with to investigate that further if you have if you are challenged in that area. Instead of polystyrene, Sealed Air came up with this great idea. It's all 100% recycled paper. Great plan. Well done, Sealed Air. And I think Alan Adams is here today, so he can take another bow. 
I would be amiss in if I was talking design and packaging if I didn't mention accessibility. People have still got to open it. And if you go and get older like I am now, look at those around you who do have arthritic concerns and the like and how do they open your packaging. Of, you know, it's an absolutely essential. Next thing is the fonts. Make sure people can read it. Get your colours right so there's contrast there. It's not hard. SPGs will discuss greatly. And, and please be aware of the materials chosen and their consequences. Key takeouts here. Start with commodities that the recyclers are after. Stick with the basics. Try as possible to not have too many materials in your packaging. The more you have, the more difficult it becomes. And if you haven't taken the time out to learn how to use prep properly, please do. AIP has training courses. APCO has references for it. It's a fabulous tool, but use it smartly, please. There you go. Sorry, we pushing time a little bit, but uh, back to you, Meredith. That's all good. Thank you, Ralph. Some great information in there and the food waste balance. I think you addressed a little bit of one of those first questions that's come through here, um, a pretty technical one. So thank you, everyone, and, and please use that Q&A if you have some questions here. So we might kick it off with the one that Tundi has asked first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Make it nice and technical, but Ralph, you seem to be able to handle this one. So, um, I'll, I'll she's right. It. <laughs> it's a long technical question. Good on to you. I can rely on you for one like this. Um, but uh, to, to summarize Tindy's yeah, question, on. it's basically looking at the waste hierarchy where we have reduction as the higher priority than recycling. Um, but we see this when potentially a packaging element might not be able to be recyclable but unless you increase the amount of packaging that's included there. So Ralph, if you could maybe talk a little bit about you know, what's the ideal solution for a particular case like this when recyclability or recoverability also means you may need to increase the packaging format and materials used. Thanks, Meredith. Sure. Look, here's a key one. Everyone thinks red cycle replays could just take every flexible plastic. Wrong. No, they can't. The reasons being that many of those plastics have different melting points and the like, and as such, can't go through their process, or if it does, it's, it generates an inferior product. So please look up the Red Cycle site, and you'll see the parameters of which they can handle. So here's Tuna's problem. Her existing laminate doesn't fit Red Cycle's skill, but it's nice and light. To make it meet red cycles requirements she's got to up the plastic and is that not a contradiction in the hierarchy and strictly speaking yes it is my answer to her is this do you want something that weighs little but you can't do anything with it or you want something that weighs a little bit more but you can repurpose it and reuse it into another thing that's the answer so i think the direction that your business has taken to an is the correct one you've understood the process you've understood what the, in this case, red cycle can and cannot handle, and you've adapted accordingly. That was the core message about the, the MRF facilities. Adapt your materials so that those guys can handle it, can sort it, and the end product goes to a, a practical use and not to landfill. So while it's strictly speaking in a very simple hierarchy, yes, it contradicts, but in reality, I think your understanding of the entire process is excellent. And I think you've made the right decision. So my compliments. Thank you, Ralph. All right, we've got um, another question here for Pippa. Um, so Pippa, um, do you see packaging as a service continuing to grow as a trend? So I guess thinking back to loop um, and more of those reuse models. And are there any barriers we should be aware of in developing packaging as a service and supporting systems like Loop? Sure. So I think from a barrier perspective, safety will be really key. Um, I think obviously after COVID, safety awareness is, is heightened more than ever. So I think building that element that won't have necessarily been a consideration or a design factor from um, uh, from a packaging point of view would need to be considered into that service. I do see it growing um, quite exponentially, I think, if we look at the growth of e-commerce as a sector. And I think there's a lot of case studies, even if we go out of packaging, where um, 
products or services are actually ingrained in our lives that we just don't, we haven't really seen the transition to them. But I do think that there is a huge benefit to packaging as a service. Um, I think it puts more responsibility, obviously, on, on brands and manufacturers, and it gives a continual loop of information um, and resource back from the customer as well. So in terms of packaging innovation and packaging development, you've got that continual feedback loop um, and loyalty from, um, from a repeat purchase perspective as well. But I think um, from a barrier perspective, the, the infrastructure will be, will be key in, in building that efficiently and overcoming any safety um, issues that you may have in terms of getting those um, items back and ensuring that they're appropriately maintained, cleaned and redistributed. Absolutely. I think it's going to be a very interesting place to add. Um, Ralph, did you have anything else to add on to that? No, I think Pippa answered it beautifully. Thank you. Great. All right. Well, we've got a few questions coming through. We'll do our best to get back to everyone. I'm just a little bit conscious of time. Um, so thank you both to Pippa and to Ralph for your fantastic presentations. Um, just before we part, um, any final words from either of you? Maybe uh, three quick things that, that people should, should keep in mind. Um, I think for me, don't, don't underestimate the, the power of design. Everything in the world that we use is, is designed. And I think that is where we've got the, the power to, to really change. But I think keep in mind um, the broader picture of what's potentially at stake if we only rely on certain systems or ways of working that don't take us to that, you know, those inner loop models. Um, they're, they're going to be difficult to achieve, particularly in some sectors and some markets. Um, but I really think that's where our, our focus um, needs to be and ask questions always. If you don't know, there will be people out there that want to help you on this journey, um, myself included. So I think if you're struggling to find the correct solution, then speak to as many people as you can, because we're all in it for the right reasons and for shared commonalities. Fantastic. Thank you, Pippa. Uh, yes, Meredith, a couple of th just two points or oh, three really I'd like to make. The very best designs in history follow the KISS principle. Keep it simple, stupid, and they're fluent and they're intuitive with how they communicate. Two, nobody knows everything about packaging. Trust me. There are great resources around you, either through APCO, who has produced any number of journals in the last 12 months, which are just fantastic, or the AIP from an education training point of view. Both organisations are very active very accessible and we're here we want you to use us so you're not alone keep asking the questions but there are resources and training facilities to assist you through this and all the other related matters to the 2025 national packaging targets thank you Fantastic. well thank you ralph and thank you pippa and again thank you everyone who's joined us here today just reiterating what Ralph has mentioned. So get to know the SPGs, the Sustainable Packaging Guidelines, access the Quick Start Guides, check out some of those AIP resources. And again, we're all here to help you as well. So if you have any further questions, feel free to get in touch with the APCO team or with Pippa and Ralph, and we can have a further conversation from there. Um, I think quite timely is next week's webinar, which is an introduction to life cycle assessments for packaging. So something that ties in nicely around design and looks at some of those questions that you were asking earlier, Tundi, around balancing um, some of those key decisions that need to be made. So hopefully we see you all there. I think the team will be popping up a short poll at the end of this session as well. So feel free to take that. We always value your feedback. And everyone have a fantastic rest of the day. Thank you again for all of your support. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.